us. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 25 tonight as we continue this series that we're in called Rise and Fall through the book of 1 Samuel. You've probably heard this statement or some version of it in your life that says, behind every man is a great woman, right? Or maybe the the Mark Twain version, he said, behind every successful man, there is a woman, and behind every unsuccessful man, there are at least two. Uh, So uh, maybe that's true, I don't know, but tonight we're going to look at one of those couples where you've probably seen these before in your life, where you go, man, how did she end up with him, right? You ever seen that couple? You're like, wow, that seems like a mismatch uh, sent from not heaven. Well, that's kind of the story of 1 Samuel 25. So just a quick recap, as you we've looked at the highs and lows of David's life over the last few weeks. Chapter 21 is kind of a, a really low point in David's life where he's lying to get what he wants and he's going to uh, another country to try to seek safety rather than seeking it in the Lord. He acts, ends up having to act like a crazy person and letting all of his slobber you know, run down his beard and writing crazy things on the wall so they think he's insane and let him go. That's not a good day in anybody's life. Then chapter 24, where we looked at last week, is a, a high water mark in David's faith up till this point. He has the opportunity to take out King Saul, his enemy, the one who's chasing him all around, trying to kill him, and yet he does the right thing and does not kill uh, the anointed king of Israel. And so that's a high water mark for him as he listened to his conscience, as he trusted God to be the judge between him and Saul rather than taking matters into his own hands. Well, then chapter 25 kind of starts out with another low point because verse 1 says there, Samuel died. And all Israel assembled to mourn for him, and they buried him by his home in Ramah. So the namesake of this book that we've been in for the past 14 weeks has died. And it's really interesting, just as a side note, that that right after Saul's declaration that David will indeed one day be king over Israel, you see the death of Samuel. It's almost like Samuel's... uh, Samuel had been called by God to see that that there would be a kingdom set up and, and that eventually that David would be king of that kingdom. And when Saul, the current king, finally acknowledges that truth, then it's Samuel's uh, time to go. His job is complete, and so he dies, and, and all Israel comes to mourn for him. But let's focus on David for just a second. Just imagine, if you will, the the loss and and the you know just disorientation that David must be feeling. He's tired. He's been on the run from Saul for years now. He he just in the last chapter met his his best friend John's or uh, Jonathan David's excuse me, Saul's son, Jonathan, for the very last time. Uh, He left his parents. He he took his parents to the king of Moab to try to keep them safe from Saul so that he wouldn't attack David's family. So he's lost his parents. His wife, Michael, Saul's daughter, has now been given to another man in marriage. So uh, she's no longer married to David. You find that out actually in chapter 25, verse 44. And now to top it all off, Samuel has died. This person who's been like a father figure to David, a a spiritual mentor, the one who believed in David when nobody else did, not even his own dad, and now he's dead. And David can't even go to the funeral. Uh, It says there in the rest of verse 1 that David went down to the wilderness of Paran, went off more than likely by himself. Uh, He got away by himself to think and to pray and to try to get his wits about him. And then some amount of time passes there because when we pick up the story again in verse 2, we're now in this region called Moan. And so in verse 2, it says, A man in Moan had a business in Carmel. He was a a very rich man with 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats and was shearing his sheep in Carmel. The man's name was Nabal and his wife Abigail. The woman was intelligent and beautiful, but the man, a Calebite, was harsh and evil in his dealings. 
So the ESV actually translated, translates it that the, the woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and behaved badly. And now I, I hope that ladies who are watching that that's not how you would describe your marriage, that you're intelligent and beautiful and the, the husband behaves badly. Um, but uh, hopefully there were no amens there in that moment. But uh, Nabal is an extreme version of that, as we'll see in the story. So, so what happens here is the David and his band of merry men, 600 men, uh, for whatever time has passed here, have been protecting Nabal and his sheep and his shepherds as they're out in the wilderness. Just like the story uh, that you find Jesus telling in the New Testament of of the of the man who was you know going along in the wilderness and then got attacked by robbers the the pro, the the good samaritan almost the prodigal son the good samaritan uh story those bands uh, of robbers were still active even all the way back here in the old testament in this wilderness there were bands of philistines that would roam around and and, and try to take out uh and capture sheep and shepherds and and try to do as much destruction as they could and so David and his men have been protecting Nabal and his and his shepherds and his sheep. Um, they had been sacrificially helping them, and they had had a banner year. It seems like, in fact, one of one of the servants down in, in verse sixteen says that David and his men were like a wall around. Uh, the shepherds and sheep, both day and night. So they had really done a good job in protecting, uh, in protecting Nabal's uh, sheep, his livelihood. And so when, if you are a shepherd, I mean, if you're a sheep raiser, rather than being, you know, a farmer who's raising crops, then sheep shearing time is like your harvest time, right? That's when you actually make money from uh, your product. And so w when that would happen, they would have their sort of harvest festival and feast, and, and they would give gifts to uh, the people who had, who had helped them uh, along the way throughout the year. And it was this time of celebration and goodwill, maybe like our Christmas. And so when that time comes here, David sends 10 of his young men to, to ask to be a part of this. They ask Asked that the Nabal would give them uh, some of of the you know the festivities. They he would give them a gift as part of their payment, so to speak, for for the protection that they had given him. And so Nabal uh, rejects that request, and, and not only does he just re. re um, not only does he just reject it, he adds uh, this stinging insult to it. He says. Who is David, anyway? Who is Jesse's son? Many slaves these days are running away from their masters. Am I supposed to take my bread, my water, and my meat that I butchered for my shearers and give them to these men? I, I don't even know where they're from. Now, the truth is, Nabal knew who David was. Otherwise, he wouldn't have called him the son of Jesse, right? He's adding insult to injury. He's not only not saying that he's not going to let them be a part of uh, the, the celebration of, of sheep shearing season. Uh, he also evidently knows why David's out in the wilderness, because he's running away from Saul. That's why he adds that line in there about the slaves running away from their masters. It's, it's just one extra little dig at David. And so David then uh, reacts uh, not well. He flies off the handle. Verse 13, he says to his men, all of you put on your swords. And so each man put on his sword and David also put on his own sword, the one most likely that he had taken from Goliath. And then you get a little bit more into what's going on in David's mind down in verse 21. He said, I guarded everything that belonged to this man in the wilderness for nothing. He was not missing anything, yet he paid me back evil for good. May God punish me and do so severely if I let any of his males survive until morning. That's serious business, right? Last week, you see David in this cave resisting the temptation to kill Saul, who was actively seeking to kill him, sitting right there in front of him doing his business. And this week... He's about to murder a bunch of innocent people because he got stiffed on uh, the tip that he had for, for protecting these people and insulted on top of it. So the guy who resisted to killing uh, his enemy is about to murder a whole household of people. It's like he passed the big test 
and then he's getting ready to fail the little one. You ever have that happen where, where you resist some temptation and, and you feel the victory and then it immediately hits you uh, with defeat over just a little thing? Well, he, here's the first thing for tonight that I want you to see in this passage. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Pride comes before a fall. Mountains come before valleys, and victory comes before temptation. You, this is true in our lives, right? Whether you're talking about your spiritual life or just life in general, if you're on the mountaintop, if, if things are all good, then that's great and praise God, but the reality is you're probably going to go into a valley or, or at least into a plain uh, before too long. And, and that's true in David's life. He has this success in his faith where he is uh he is resisting the temptation to take out his enemy and then the very next chapter he has had enough samuel's dead all the stuff that we just talked about he is already at the end of his rope and you know as well as i do that when you already feel like you're on edge just one little thing can send you over and that's what happens to david when he hears what nabal said he says men get your swords on. We're going to go and and take care of this. We're going to get what's coming to us, and he's going to get what's coming to him. See, really at the core of what's going on here, uh, a few things in sin-wise that David's having going on in his heart, but I think ultimately the thing is pride. Pride is really at the core of this. He's insulted that, that this fool would say something to him, the future king of Israel, God's anointed. He says, who's David? Who's this son of Jesse? I'll tell you what, I'm going to show you who the son of Jesse is, a man that you don't mess with. That's who. Let's go, boys. And he's tr- they strap on their swords. He leaves 200 of his men there with the supplies, and he takes 400 with him to head towards Nabal's house to clean his clock, so to speak. Proverbs 16, 18, David's son, Solomon, says pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. See, godly people, godly people are still sinful people. And we all have these moments where we fly off the handle. We all have these moments where we we may resist the big temptation, but then fall when it seems like a little one. Uh, Paul, in the New Testament, had to confront Peter for denying the gospel. And we still have to confront sin today. There's also this righteousness versus self-righteousness thing that's, that's going on here. That when, when you and I live righteously, when we're living by the Spirit's power and, and we're living in relationship with God, we may not be perfect, but we're in general living with God, there, there's a sense of pride and, and satisfaction that we have at doing the right thing. Have you ever faced a temptation and then you did the right thing and you just get filled with this, this feeling of good? It's really your conscience that we talked about last week that you know had condemned David when he cut off the corner of Saul's robe. It's the reverse side of that. When, when you do something right, your conscience says That's, that was the right thing to do, good for you. But the danger comes when you see someone doing the very thing that you just refused to do. At that moment, it's so easy to go, what? How dare you? See, we're, you've been convinced of the evil of that act in your own heart, so much so that you're repulsed by it when you see it in others. It's one of the most ironic things that we can actually be the most judgmental of, to other people about sins that we ourselves have struggled with. I I know I see this with my own children. I am more hard on them. And I've realized this even this week as I studied for this text. I'm harder on them about sins that I see in myself and that I I see reflected in them because I, I don't want them to deal with it. I want to nip it in the bud, as Barney Fife would say. Nip it in the bud. you got to nip it. you got to nip the sin in the bud. But a lot of the time, I'm reacting more to that own reflection of my sin in them than I am trying to disciple uh, their little hearts. We are not righteous on our own, right? The, if you did the right thing, 
that was by the grace of God that you did that right thing. If you did the right thing with the right motivations, that was by the grace of God even more. Because sometimes we'll do the right thing with the wrong motivation, right? Paul said in Romans, there is nothing good in me. It all comes from him. And so we have to be careful not to let our righteousness that was imputed to us by Christ morbidly switch into self-righteousness where we look at someone else who's dealing with a sin, maybe that we've dealt with or maybe a different one, they, they sin in a different way and we go, oh, I can't believe they would do that. And yet we were so close to doing the same thing or doing some other thing that would be just as evil in God's sight. There, there's also not only the self-righteous part, but there's also the, the difference between godly anger and ungodly anger. There'll be other times in the story where you see David righteously angry. When he's fighting against Goliath, he's righteously angry, not because the Goliath has offended him. He doesn't say anything when Goliath says, "What do you, you send, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? He doesn't. He doesn't take personal offense to that. What he's taking offense to is the fact that Goliath is defaming the name of the Lord God of Israel. But this time, he's taking offense to the fact that his name has been dishonored. See, James chapter 1, in the the verse, I think we may have even looked at it last week, that said we should be slow slow to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry because, verse 20, human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Remember last week we said you will not get to God's purposes in your life by disobeying God's commands. This is an extension of that specific to one thing. You will not accomplish God's righteousness by human anger and wrath. And that's the place that David finds himself here. Ephesians chapter 4 says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. That's hard, right? We can, we can admit that is hard. The only way that you can possibly do that is to give your anger to him. You can, anger will keep you awake at night, right? You're, if, if I get mad, even if, even if it's not something about me, if it's something in the news, if it's, if it's something that somebody said to someone else that they've been hurt and now I get angry about it, it's hard for me to go to sleep. And it probably is for you too. Right? What, if you're not going to let the sun go down on your anger, if you're not going to go to bed angry, that means you're going to have to give it to God and say, Lord, I'm going to go to sleep now. Be angry about this for me and, and help me not to pick it back up in the morning. This is hard stuff, but it's what God calls us to do. We can be angry, but be angry and do not sin. Don't, let, don't give the devil an opportunity to get a foothold in your life because of the sin. But David, David hasn't heard that scripture because it hadn't been written yet. David, has, he's in the middle of this where he is just in a rage. He's, he's got blood shot eyes. He is ready, uh, ready to, like I said, to clean somebody's clock. Thankfully, if you get to the second part of the story, let's pick it back up. Enter Abigail, this, this beautiful, intelligent woman that we heard about in verse 3. One of, one of Nabal's men goes to her after he heard what Nabal said, and he tells her how David and his men had treated them in the wilderness, and then how Nabal had just treated them when they came to be a part of the sheep shearing festivities. He says, now consider carefully what you should do, Abigail, because there is certain to be trouble for our master and his entire family. He is such a worthless fool, nobody can talk to him. Notice that this this guy, I love that he just lays it out there for her, and you notice that she doesn't argue with him. He doesn't give her advice on what to do. It's, it's obvious that he trusts her judgment in this. He just relays the situation and, and trusts her wisdom and encourages her to act and act quickly. And she does. She springs into action. She gathers up a giant gift basket, um, you know, with bread in it and, and I don't know, some Starbucks gift cards and like all the stuff. And she wraps it up and she puts it on a donkey and she hops on and she takes off to, to try to intercept them. And she's coming around the mountain just as David and the men are coming around the mountain as they come. And so she comes down. She she, she gets off of her horse or donkey. She bows down before him. She's humble before him. And here's what she says. She knelt at his feet and said, The guilt is mine, my Lord, but please let your servant speak to you directly. Listen to the words of your servant. 
My Lord should pay no attention to this worthless fool Nabal, for he lives up to his name. His name means stupid, and stupidity is all he knows. I, your servant, didn't see my Lord's young men whom you sent. You know, as we found out that we were going to have a new baby in May, obviously, pretty quickly along the way, we start talking about baby names, and we found out it was a girl, and so now we're looking at girl names, and we pretty much pretty much settled, I think, on, on Mabel Eloise, but uh, before that, you're looking at all these lists, you know, uh, of baby names, uh, and, and there are some absolutely ridiculous ones and ridiculous spellings of names. Uh, for the life of me, I do not understand why you would want to curse your children with names naming them a normal name and then spelling it in some crazy way so that they will have to spell it every single time uh, that they give their name the rest of their lives. But anyway, um, we try to keep it simple. Ben, Dana, uh, Addie, Mabel. Fool was not high on our list, but Nabal actually means fool in Hebrew, which is just terrible. I don't know his parents, you know, or maybe it's a nickname. I don't know that he earned apparently, but if it is his actual name, I don't know. His parents kind of looked at him. Must not have been the most attractive baby in the world. Maybe they thought they were the fools. I don't know, but uh, they give him the name fool and he lives up to that name. And, and, and she says to him, listen, Nabal's a fool. He lives up to his name. Uh, His name means stupid, and stupidity is all he knows. I mean, uh, it is not often that you hear a woman in the Bible talk this way, uh, and it is hilarious, and it is true in this case. It's not hilarious for this situation. So what is is her uh, strategy for for dealing with David. Well, she reminds David of God's promises. Look down here in verse 28. She says, Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord is certain to make a lasting dynasty for my Lord, because he fights the Lord's battles. Throughout your life, may evil not be found in you. So she says to him, listen, God is going to make a lasting kingdom, a lasting dynasty for you. And that is the very first time in Scripture that you hear of David's kingdom being an everlasting kingdom. We're gonna, we'll see it in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where, where God gives that promise to David. But the first place that promise comes up is from this woman, Abigail. She goes on to say, Someone is pursuing you and intends to take your life. But my Lord's life is tucked safely in the place where the Lord your God protects the living. But he is flinging flinging away your enemies' lives like stones from a sling. Now I'll tell you, as someone who deals with words every week, who labors over to how to say things the right, say the right things in the right way, they'll be memorable and, and will uh, help God's people. I literally sat back in my chair and kind of chuckled and went. Dang, uh, this week, as I read those words, it's just absolutely sheer brilliance on the part of Abigail and the Holy Spirit speaking through her. What's she doing? She's reminding David of God's promises to him, his faithfulness to keep them in the past. He, he's slinging away your enemies, David, like you swung that sling towards Goliath. So put away Goliath's sword next to you. She's saying without saying it, remember where your hope is, David. See, here's the second thing for tonight. First of all, pride comes before fall. The mountains come before the valleys. Victory comes before temptation. Here's the second thing. Behind faithful, behind every faithful person are faithful people. Behind every faithful person is a whole bunch of faithful people. Abigail, in this case, was a person who was faithful and and came at just the right time in David's life. Abigail was faithful to take the risk. This was a risky move for her. She says uh, at the very beginning, may the guilt, uh, the guilt is mine, my Lord, which is just amazing because no, it wasn't. It wasn't hers. And yet she took it on herself. It's not fun, I assume. I don't know. Uh, Kay, if you're watching, I don't know. I I don't know what it's like to be married to a fool. But I can't imagine that it's very fun. And all Abigail had to do to get out of this marriage is to sit back, to let David's men come, and to say, oh, finally. But she didn't. 
She was faithful to take action. She was faithful to her marriage vows. She was faithful to take the risks, to, to do something to save someone, in fact, a whole bunch of people. And Nina Dolce, she's a, a, a lady who wrote an article on, on the Gospel Coalition about this passage. She said, Abigail stepped into the narrative like a busy triage nurse, assessing damage and treating wounds. See, it's a risk for us to confront sin. But you know what the greater risk is? Not confronting it in our own lives and in the lives of people we love and are in relationship with. My, my dad always used to say when it came to ministry and just life in general, if you don't deal with your problems, your problems will deal with you. And Abigail put everything on the line to save Nabal's men. And, and if we are going to play the role that God would have us to in being peacemakers, in, in being uh, agents of reconciliation between God and people, b- between people and people, then if we're going to help a bad situation from becoming worse like what Abigail does, then it's going to cost us. The reality is when you share a burden with another person, then there's a cost of that. You are, your, your heart is going to be heavier. It's going to be troubled because you're, you're taking on a portion of their burden. Your life, your heart is not going to be as peace, peaceful. Your sleep may not even be as good. It, if the conversations that you know you're going to have to have don't go well, you may even lose the relationship with that person. But listen, it's worth it. Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, just like Abigail did, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. So we have to carry one another's burdens. And if someone is overtaken by any wrongdoing, like like dealing with the anger that David's dealing right now. Those who are spiritual are supposed to go and restore that person. We don't come with self-righteousness, like, I can't believe you did that. No, like, if we believe we're sinners, then we can believe we would do that. What we need to do is, is work towards the restoration, the repentance and restoration of those people with a gentle spirit, like Hannah did. She comes bowing low. She comes bringing gifts. She comes as a servant to David. And, and we have to do the same. Be willing to put uh, everything on the line for God's glory and for the eternal good of people. They are worth it, and he is worth it. He's worth the risk. She speaks calmly and, and with clarity in this emotionally charged, tense situation. And not only that, she was faithful not only to take the risk, but she was faithful to deal with the spiritual issue. She could have left it just with the superficial, listen, David, this is not worth it. You don't want this uh, to get out. You don't want to be the murderer of, you know, some large number of people who didn't have anything to do with this. That's just dealing with the surface level, right? But she went deeper. Uh, She says, when the Lord does for my Lord all the good he's promised you and appoints you ruler over Israel, there will not be remorse or a troubled conscience for my Lord because of the needless bloodshed or my Lord's revenge. Now, Abigail had no way of knowing what had happened in that cave just a few weeks before, right? She didn't know that it was David's conscience that was the thing that got to him when he cut off uh, the edge of Saul's robe, but God did, and he used Abigail to break through David's hard heart in that moment. See, if, if our goal is to simply stop a behavior, then, then dealing with the surface level may be enough, at least for a little while. But if the goal is healing of the soul, of spiritual health and maturity, of true repentance to God and to people, then we have to, we must go deeper than just the surface level issue. You can't just stay picking off bad fruit. You have to go at the root of the problem. And and in the Christian life, it's sort of the cliche saying, but it's true, the heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. She's saying to David, listen, you do not want this on your conscience. When when you are inevitably king of Israel, as the Lord has said that he will do, you don't want to have to, to, and when you're telling the story of your kingdom, have to try to leave out this part where you slaughtered a bunch of innocent people because you got insulted and upset about it. She gets to the spiritual heart of the matter. And then you see faithfulness also in David to listen 
and to hear God's voice through others, in this case, through Abigail speaking to her and speaking to him. And we need to be faithful to stop and to listen to brothers and sisters in Christ and, and to hear, to listen to God's voice through them. David listened and he was glad he did. If you skip down to verse 35, it says, Then David accepted what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. See, I, I have heard what you said and I have granted your request. It seems like we've talked about this a lot in this series, but we need each other, just like David needed Jonathan and Jonathan needed David, just like Samuel needed the people around him. We need people around us. We need to live in community, in fellowship with other believers who know our stuff. You have, and I have, blind spots, and you can't see them, which is why they're called blind spots. And if you don't have someone else to, to step in and say, hey, can I talk to you for a second? Do you, think this, do you think this is wise? Do you think this is the way? What would God have you do? What would the Spirit say? And that what are you believing about who he is and, and how, uh, what he's done and, and how, well, your relationship with him in this moment? Proverbs 18.1, I know I've quoted Proverbs a few times tonight. It says, one who isolates himself pursues selfish desires, period. Well, semicolon, but that's, that, that is inevitably true. He rebels against all sound wisdom because you don't want to hear sound wisdom. You just want to go off on your own. So pride comes before a fall, mountains before valleys, victory before temptation. Behind every faithful person are faithful people, usually a whole bunch of them, helping them along the way. And then here's the last thing for tonight. Above all, there is a righteous and restraining God. That's what Abigail said. She went and, and uh, brought these gifts to David and bowed before him and, and gave her her speech of what David was doing and trying to get him to change his mind. And, and part of that, she says, Now, my Lord, in verse 26, As surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, it is the Lord who kept you from participating in bloodshed and avenging yourself by your own hand. May your enemies and those who intend to harm my Lord be like Nabal. So she believes, even in the moment, she's talking in the past tense, even though she's still in the middle of trying to convince David that he should not uh, go and slaughter her household. In fact, I, I just wonder if she's looking and seeing David's eyes softening and realizing that by God's grace, she's getting through. She says, it's the Lord who kept you from participating in bloodshed and avenging yourself by your own hand. I'm here, I'm the one doing it, but really it's the Lord working through me. And, and, and not only did, is that what she said, but that's what David believed. When, when she got done with her speech down in verse 32, he, it says, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you to meet me today. May your discernment be blessed and may you be blessed. Today you kept me from participating in bloodshed and avenging myself by my own hand. He repeats her same words back to her. He gives glory to God. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you to meet me today. And then he says, you kept me from participating in bloodshed and avenging myself by my own hand. See, it's, it's both of these things. When we are faithful to confront sin, to, to try to help one another grow in holiness, then it, th there's this m almost magical thing that happens where we are doing something, we are taking action, and yet the Spirit is guiding and leading. And so God gets the glory, and, and, and we are a part of that, and that is our reward, that He gets the glory, and this person is kept from sin or, or brought back. And, and not only did, is that what Abigail said and what David believed, it's also what God did. He is a, a God of restraining grace and of righteousness. It says, then Abigail went home to Nabal, and there he was in his house holding a feast fit for a king. Nabal's heart was cheerful, and he was very drunk, so she didn't say anything, uh, anything to him until morning light, probably because he wouldn't have remembered it by morning light. One guy I, I read this week said, here is David, a, a, a future king, almost acting like a fool, and here is a fool pretending to be a king. 
Nabal's feasting, like a feast fit for a king. He had plenty to give to David and his men, but he chose not to. And then in the morning when Nabal sobered up, his wife told him about these events and his heart died and he became a stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal dead. He had a, a massive heart attack, or maybe a stroke, most likely a heart attack and, and died. So God was righteous. David was right in being offended. God was offended by what Nabal had done. And, and in fact, probably of all of Nabal's life, because the way that the Israel economy was set up in the Old Testament, in the Levitical law, it would have been very, very difficult for a man to become this rich without, without being evil in his ways of going about business. And God is very serious about those kind of matters. And then when he insults David in this way, God is going to judge, and God does judge. But he does it himself, and he didn't need David's help. And by God's grace, through Abigail's faithfulness, God kept, by his restraining grace, his future king, the, the ancestor of Jesus Christ, to, he kept him from shedding innocent blood and avenging himself, because that is not the way. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. So what, what should we take from this tonight? What are the conclusions, the application uh, of tonight? Well, for women and men, but uh, I'll say for women because it's Abigail, we should be like Abigail in our lives towards others. You know, uh, even as the, uh, the father of now three daughters, one still in utero, uh, I, I want to raise them and, and I will pray as I, as I tuck them into bed like I, uh, like I will tonight, most likely, uh, as I pray over them, one of the things I pray at least once or twice a week with them is that they will just grow up to be fierce, ferocious women of God. The, I, I want them to grow up to be theologically robust, be able to go toe-to-toe with anyone, but to, but to also be able to do so with grace and humility. I, I want to raise daughters who are women of God who have boldness and beauty and brains, discernment, intelligence like Abigail. And we should be like Abigail, be faithful to take action and to trust in God's providence when we're confronted with a situation, when somebody tells us what's going on, like that servant did, we spring into action, not for our own protection, but for God's glory and for others' good. Not only did she save Nabal's household, she also saved David himself. And then for men and women, uh, but we'll talk about the men because we're talking about Nabal and David. Men, don't be a Nabal. Don't, don't be a Nabal. Be like David, after uh, Abigail had con confronted him, listen, we need Abigail's. Every single one of us needs Abigail-like people in our lives, but we have to listen to them. We have to be willing to hear, to hear our own sin being reflected back to us. We, we need to be able to have, people call it constructive criticism, but the Bible goes way further than that. It talks about protecting one another and lifting one another up and encouraging one another and, and standing back to back, shoulder to shoulder, so that we can, can together fight for holiness, fight for godliness, fight for uh, the, the kingdom of God growing in our own hearts and lives and fight against the, the forces of evil in our world. And, and just like last week, David said, at the end there that, that after, after Nabal had died, that he praises God that he didn't take matters into his own hands. And he, he praises God that God had championed his cause. And for us, we have to trust that God will be the one who champions our cause. And so we don't have to take matters into our own hands. And now, the last thing, just to wrap up for tonight. I, I've just said that these characters in this story should serve as examples to us, both of how to live in, in, in ways that please that pleases God and how not to live. The, the, even though the worst of us can serve as bad examples, right? We, we've got examples to follow in the scripture. But we can never end there as Christians reading the Old Testament. Uh, that, that same article that I quoted before, she said this, and it was so good that I just have to quote it. She said, The Bible isn't primarily a collection of ethical principles, but the epic drama of redemption. 
And, and so we should always, always, always be looking for glimpses of the gospel in every story that we read in God's word, because Jesus taught us to read it that way. He said that they're all, to, all ultimately pointing us to him. Every story whispers his name. And in this story, Abigail is the closest picture we have of our Savior. She's a wise, prophetic voice that steps into this dark situation. She rides in on a donkey. She humbles herself. She voluntarily takes the guilt upon herself, even though she is completely innocent. She says, may the guilt May the guilt be mine, my Lord. And what did Jesus do on the cross? He said, may their guilt be mine, my Lord. She offered a meal of peace. And even more than that, it was lamb. Just like the lamb who was slain. By her bravery and by her sacrifice, she wins the salvation of many, many people. And all of that points us to King Jesus, the true son of David that would be coming, who would lay down his life for all of us treasonous Nabals. Because we've all turned away from him. We all miss the mark. We all fall short of the glory of God. And yet God sent him to take the guilt of our sin and to set us free, to be able to look at ourselves honestly, to be able to listen to others with grace, and to be able to share with others with grace so that we can build one another up into spiritual maturity. And one last thing for tonight. You and I can trust in the restraining grace of God because He will keep us. He will not let our souls be lost. As the song we're just getting ready to sing says, He will not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last. Even though my heart is often cold, the restraining grace of God over us through Christ says, He will hold us fast.